Hello, Kayla Rowan. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Sarah. How are you today? Well, after hearing that you are in natural light right now, and this is the best I can do in my dark room in Washington with the light, the lamps in my room, I'm doing a bit worse <laughs> because I want to go back home to Missouri now, which is where you are to be in that sunshine. It is. And you know, one of the reasons I live here is this sunshine. Yeah. Um, I introduced you as Kayla Rowan, but I just noticed on your um, name, name is the Wheeler. Can you start with who are you and what is your name and what do you do? Um, I am a woman of many names. And so publicly, uh, I'm most often known as Kayla Rowan. I am legally Kayla Wheeler. I will probably answer to any of those names because I've always just thought of myself as Kayla. How did you get into herbal medicine? What drew you to plants or what, what was your first connection with the natural world like? Yes, those are all related. Um, it's all the same question. Yes, those are all related. Well, um, my first reckoning with a different existence or reality than what we're in um, actually happened when I was three years old. And I was at a um, cousin's farm in Northern Missouri and after we went home that evening, my mother um, was talking about things we had done that day and I didn't remember any of them. I remember different things happening. And uh, within about two weeks, we got a photograph from that day. Oh yeah, it took two weeks because we had to take the film in to uh, you know, get it developed. <laughs> And so we did, and um, there was a picture, and it was a picture of me, but it wasn't me, and I didn't pose for the picture, and um, over time, I had some dreams that kind of helped me understand what was going on, and I'd had a little fairy encounter, and so that kind of got me in tune, I think, uh, with a more natural world that is separate from our scientific reality, which don't get me wrong, I like that stuff too, but I really did uh, enjoy my little traipsing at three uh, with the fairies. But most of my, uh, my herbal longings really started with my father. Uh, my dad uh, was a lay herbalist and he stayed studied with the Dominion School in British Columbia, uh, did mostly correspondence with them and was a real naturalist at teaching me about um, uh, the world around us, nature. Um, he, he was an interesting fellow. He, he did a lot of different things. We, he took a geology course and then all of a sudden we had spelunking equipment and we're diving into caves and uh, sloshing around in mud, which, I don't enjoy any longer, but I really enjoyed it as a teenager. It was it was exciting and it was different. Um, and so he started teaching me about uh, herbal medicine when I still lived at home. And then as I had children, I tried to uh, raise them a little more naturally. My kids didn't go to the doctor very much. Um, you know, my probably my favorite healing modality is water. Um, and it, it sounds funny, but if you ask my children, water heals everything. Oh, you have a headache, drink a glass of water. Oh, you have a stomach ache, drink a glass of water. Everything seems to be healed with a glass of water. And then I, I, I got into corporate America. I did my little stint with the corporate world and re finished raising my children and, um, and after that, um, I had a little bout with cancer. And I, 
I had surgery for the cancer, but I refused chemotherapy. And the doctor that I had at that time quit me because uh, I would not take chemotherapy. And what that meant was I was in managed care, so I couldn't go see another doctor. There was no other doctor to be seen within the group that was offered through my work, my insurance. Um, so after surgery and was just kind of on my own and trying to figure out what, what I was going to do. And I saw an article in a magazine on Susan Weed. And um, so I called Susan Weed and I told her my situation. And Susan said, well, if I was in your situation, I would use burdock and red clover. And so that really sparked my, my mind. Those were plants that I knew and, and knew how to identify in the area. Uh, so I started using burdock and red clover. And um, uh, I, had, uh, I had been cancer free for a long time uh, until just last year when I had another little bout. But there again, burdock, uh, red clover, and surgery is my friend. So, so I came to herbalism kind of as a child, kind of as a young person, kind of as a teenager, definitely as I was raising my children, uh, simple home remedies, kitchen remedies. And then uh, once I had my own health crisis, uh, I got a little more serious about it. So uh, it's always a personal journey with me. Uh, I like to share it. I like to share it with others and help others understand how they might uh, have a more comfortable life um, using herbal remedies and having plants just generally in our lives. So that's kind of how I came to it. There are so many threads of that that I resonate with. And then I'm like, oh, right, because I studied with you for years. And like, I feel like my, can, I come back to you so often in my head, especially these past couple of years since moving to Washington and diving into naturalist studies and to hear that you were so influenced by calling, you know, calling your father a naturalist and like, he takes us a rock class and the whole family goes and learns about rocks like of course that's exactly how I would do it now now that I'm thinking about um like how to teach children I mean that's what I'm, I'm working in outdoor school like how do kids learn without a classroom and we learn by going and doing things like that and observing the natural world and taking a closer look and asking questions um and something you've always you have deeply instilled in me is to do the experiment and it kind of comes back to that like the art of questioning what you're describing like with the way you're you learn from your father and the way that you've taught me and others do you think that like doing the experiment is the basis for a lot of your connection to the natural world or or is that related how is that I related? think it's twofold yeah, I think I really do. I think it, it's kind of twofold. I think part of it is that let's go prove what we think. I have this idea about the natural world. I have this idea about the moss on the rock, all right, or a plant. I have an idea about this plant. And then we do the experiment and that experiment may be on ourselves. It may not be. If it's a plant, we don't know. It probably shouldn't be until we know who it is. However, you could do the experiment on the plant. But the other side of that is we, we need to be left alone sometimes so that we can explore you know, one of the things that I love to do with children is teach them like three things and then let them just be. And all of those three things will come into play. We used to do that at the farm. When we would have children out to the garden at the farm, we would teach them three plants and we would taste them. And pretty soon everybody would be coming together, 
they would have harvested into their basket or their bowl, and then they're sharing with one another and they're talking about it. We didn't make them do that. We didn't tell them to do that. It's what happened when they were left alone. You know, one of the great things my father gave me was alone time outdoors. I, I, I am probably part of that ends of generations, I think my, my older children fell into this, but where we got to play outside all the time. We got to be outdoors, and we got to be outdoors when it was hot and when it was cold and when it was raining and when it was snowing. And we had to come to, up with our own devices of how to work in that world. And I, I think we miss that today. And that's, you know, I love that that's what you're doing. You're, you're building areas for children to experience uh, the outdoors again. And the plants are such an important part of that. Oh, the, the, I feel like alone time with plants, they will teach you things. If you give yourself the space and time, <laughs> you will start to learn from them. And Um, wow. I was so into what you were saying that I lost where I wanted to go with it. Um, oh, but I, I oh, I resonated with that giving my father giving me that too, with my, I feel like growing up where I did, I remember specifically the house, the land and going to meet the land before there was ever a house there at like six years old, maybe even five at that point. And, and like, this is where it will be. And then, and just recently going back home at 30 years old, going home for the holidays, you know, and seeing those baby trees and, and the 20, you know, seven year old house. That's that like a place was made so that a family, me being that child could have a little bit of space away from the busyness of things. And that little backyard, like not little, this, you know, 10 acres of a backyard and that little forest there wasn't was the playground for my development and that and like the way that that space alone with nature looking back hearing you telling that story like something you've reminded me is like you sometimes you don't know your story until you tell it and like here we are telling each other our stories and and me being able to reflect back on wow that was it growing up having that connection and now working in a forest school where sometimes that is the that child's only connection to that thing to that to that place um that they have to just be and explore with the wild um is it is it the wild is that what it is to you it's the wild it's the wildness within us it's the, it's the part of us that we try constantly to tame, and yet it screams to be expressed. Um, we, I, I sometimes think that the more civilized we become, the further away from nature we become, that, that it's, it's almost opposites. And you know, Sarah, I'm a big both and woman. I don't like either or situations. I like things to be in a both and realm where we can have this and that, and we don't have to be at odds on what we have. But I'm not so sure that, you know, civilized is where we really want to be. And yet I like my warm little house and I like indoor plumbing. And I like some of the things that our modern world gives us. I do know that I'm really counting on the uh, generations to figure out a cleaner, safer, more earth-friendly way uh, for us to live in a modern world. And part of that's getting in tune with the plants again, getting in touch remembering that modern that uh, that natural world of which we come from and we are not separate from do you think it's physically building new things cuz i've been kind of lately just kind of stuck in my real estate brain with like is it taking 
ex- we already have the tools like we already have the technology to live connected in in touch with plants again but i'm also thinking of the the need for affordable housing and like how many people are becoming more and more people are becoming more housed in places that don't keep them in touch with the natural world or the wild um and like their whole life and my whole life and many people's lives is just you know from point a to point b and nature is just this thing you have to get through and in the winter you kind of embody that in some regard too like you're kind of running from the weather (laughs) some often um but or or is it literally building new places or new ways do we have how what are the ways that we do live a more in touch life is it just changing our routines or do we have to build new homes like Mm, I think I think it's probably all of that and there are already places that function more ecologically um, than what we do here in the United States. And so we're going to have to learn some of those ways uh, from from other peoples. Um, I think we can retrofit some things. I think we're seeing a lot of it now. And, you know, here what I'm dealing with is we have a city that has a water department that's infrastructure is over 130 years old and trying to retrofit it isn't working very well. So I think when we find that retrofitting isn't gonna work, then we're gonna have to look at something new. The other example I would use that's here in town that I'm aware of is we have a, um, a tiny house village, not too far from where I live. And it is for uh, veterans. And uh, the tiny houses are solar. So their electric needs are all coming from the rooftops of the tiny houses. This is a great step. Not only are we housing our veterans, but we're also doing it in a cleaner, uh, greener manner. And so I, I think every little bit of it helps. And I think we get smarter all the time. And we, there is a lot of trash mentality. I don't know how else to put it. Uh, Oh, I can throw this trash out my window. Oh, I can, you know, pitch stuff on the street. Um, Oh, I can throw my cigarette butt along the trail. Um, There's going to be some of that, but the more that we look at um, those folks and say, hey, we, we, we'd rather do this differently. I think over time, people will come around. I think over time, people really do want to make a safer, better world for their children and their grandchildren. And um, sometimes when we put it in those terms, what we do changes. Is it the when you say the infrastructure of the water is it like uh, like the sewage system under the is it the piping is it how much infrastructure are you talking about that need would need to be totally rehauled in the city or is it the way that they're handling it or because I'm so curious about like well if if you were to because then it becomes like you have people who are using up a lot of utilities right next to people who are using up nearly zero and you think okay well how can we literally redevelop what we're doing and so and what over time doesn't work like if you what do you do to move the water in a city that 150 years from now you know what could be good or what could be bad and like there are when you talk about water, yeah. So what what needs to be changed there? Well, and and we have issues with water around the country, right? We have, and yeah. as I said earlier, it's kind of like my first healing modality is water, and so uh, it's always kind of in the forefront of my brain of what we're doing. We had a system here 
the, the runoff from the streets, the runoff from rain was going through our water treatment plants. Um, because all the sewage was in one pipeline. And so what they've been doing is going through and separating the street runoff, building catch basins to uh, catch it during times of flood and keeping our sewage system to only having to treat uh, the sewage that is coming from our homes. And so that's a that's a huge endeavor, and we're not even that big of a city. I mean, we're not small by any means, but we're not that huge either. And this is the way the city was built at a time when contracts went to the lowest bidder. So sometimes what you got was a system that didn't work very well. So some of it, yes, absolutely has to be retrofitted. Uh, some of it we have to infrastructure. And and I'm I'm all I do is go to the meetings with the city to listen to see how they're going to change the problem. I um runoff into my driveway and I couldn't get out of my driveway when it was raining. And I asked the city for help with that. And it took them 30 years to respond, but they did. And they finally built me a drain. But that's because I was going to all of these city meetings to try to understand the runoff problem. You know, and that's that's one small part of us trying to live closer to nature. Um, are we gonna need cities? Yes. That's why we need sanctuary. That's why we need to be able to get away, go into retreat, go to the mountain, go to the desert, go to the rainforest, go elsewhere, have a big experience. Take that home with us, hold on to it, work through it until the next time we get to go have this big experience in a place that is uh, majestic. And I can show you majestic places in Missouri. We can even find them right in town. And so because of that, those become sanctuary times and we don't have to always live in those places. I think that's another thing that we're kind of I'm messing with in our world right now is everybody wants to move to the most beautiful places. Well, if everyone's there, it doesn't look like it used to. Yeah, it looks different. And because of that, maybe we live in one type of area. And again, we go to sanctuary elsewhere for that big experience. And that that big experience could be uh, harvesting a plant that you've never been able to get before and being able to make medicine out of it. It could be a spiritual journey of some sort. It could be an intellectual journey. Uh, we could be learning things along the way. Uh, one of the things that's really fun when to traveling is history, learning history and um, and learn a variety of histories. Don't just choose one story. Uh, make sure that we get the perspective of everyone who was involved and just not who we might have thought was the main character. I What I'm hearing is, is, yeah, I love that my question was like, do we already have infrastructure or do we need to build more infrastructure and you're like yes <laughs> and so eloquently explained why because to have home and have a place to journey to you there is no like one way to build home and I and that's kind of what these discussions and my whole idea of of, of business in in loving helping people find home is 
because it looks so different for different people and what oasis looks like can look different for different people but it is you know you bring up an interesting point with beauty um because living somewhere that you find beautiful it feels really important and that seems like a big part of why people love where they live is like beauty has something to do with it and to be feel at home and safe and like my nervous system's like okay we can rest here because a place is beautiful um that seems to be a key ingredient so so maybe in the rebuilding of the current infrastructure we keep that in mind and like how to really intentionally make home beautiful yes i agree with you we do that's one of the things that uh, really came to heart with me when I was in Italy was everything was beautiful. Everyone saw everything with a sense of beauty, um, through the eyes of beauty, um, and would look people one another in the eye to see their beauty. Oh, is your beauty in there? Mm -hmm. So I, I really enjoyed that when a, a lesson I, that I learned there uh, in Italy. We also have to remember that beautiful is different to different people. And um, uh, my granddaughter has recently moved to the middle of the country, having come from Oregon, and um, it's quite a shock for her. We have tornadoes, and uh, and she's living a little bit further south in here, so she is really experiencing the tornado drama. And she will a lot of times just call me when she's afraid and we will work through it until she's not afraid any longer. But she likes where she is. She likes the difference. She likes the excitement that the thunderstorm brings. She's just afraid of the tornado. And so I keep helping her understand that, you know, some people have lived here their entire lives and never seen one. Um, I'm kind of different. My dad, when there again, here his his influence, when there would be a tornado, we would go outside. We would go outside and look and That's see so what weird. the clouds look like and smelled it and felt it on our skin. And and so those are the things I try to tell my granddaughter. That's how we fall in love with a new place, is by really becoming immersed in it. Or, you know, my phrase, get juicy with it. That's me. I want everything to get really oh, juicy. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, just get juicy with it. That's that's the thing. So she is with tornadoes right now. I had to figure out why I love living in Missouri because I was always trying to escape. And, you know, sometimes I was successful in escaping and sometimes not. But I love the sky here. The, the, the sky does things here that it doesn't do anywhere else. And uh, so that's really my thing is we get a lot of sunshine in the wintertime. And the sky is big and massive and I can see the horizon. And the horizon makes the sky look different. So it's part of that's part of the joy of life, don't you think? Is finding finding the joy of where you are in in any given moment. I mean, that joy can come during a trip, or it can come just in in everyday life. I I like my deck in my backyard. You know, find joy in those things. Find joy in the plants that grow around you. And give them a taste. Totally. I mean, I loved my house in independence. I just knew I didn't want to stay there forever. I knew something else was calling. And now I'm loving Duval, Washington, where it feels a lot like my little hometown in some ways, but the landscape is so different and the sky is so different. And I find myself longing for the, for bigger sky. And I, back when I was back home in Missouri, um, over the holidays, like, the sunsets were just, I, I, 
it was it, captivating because it was like realizing the thing I used to know and which was a relationship with that kind of Fine. sky. And now I have a relationship with the new kinds of trees that I've never known. And to build that really, it's, it's, that's one of the, the things that I loved about first going from Missouri to New Mexico with you to learn about plants from a different landscape and to go out to the desert and to realize how alive and rich even a desert landscape is because to my lush Midwestern eyes and now even more lush, you know, rainforest, Washington eyes, like the desert just seems dead. But if you know about plants and you know how to build a relationship with a place, like you can, I feel like you can see the aliveness everywhere because even there, um, or I guess if we go to so far as like places that need to be restored because they're like desolate, but um well maybe that's a question can I mean you you kind of instilled in me the life in the desert and um what was your lesson there why did you take us there why uh, what were you I, trying to <laughs> teach um I believe the desert is about stripping us to our bones stripping off all the the frilly flesh that is upon us so that we can get down to the things that are our foundation and our bones. And uh, for many years, I think of myself a bit as a bone collector and I don't necessarily hold on to bones. Like you'll not, you'll not find a bunch of animal bones at my house or any anything like that. My bones are really people. So we go out to the desert, we strip ourselves down to our bones, and we are forever tied to one another. And it happens, and it happens naturally in the desert, because we had to depend on one another. Life was not lush. Life was difficult. Same as when there's a big snowstorm. Okay, life is difficult. You have to depend on one another. It makes everything, it makes all your relationships tighter. So when we go out to the desert and we find those teeny tiny little plants that, you know, are thirsty for water and yet they grow and they're there and they're medicine. How wonderful. What a great lesson for us that everywhere we have been given food and medicine and we even find water in the desert you know we go to the hot springs in the desert we go to the river that's running cool and swift right so, next to the hot springs <laughs> right next to the hot springs right in the middle of the desert so those it it life is rich and lush and Sometimes I, I think we get into this deprived mentality of what we don't have versus all this lushness that we do have. And so that's one of the reasons why I like to take um, people to the desert and have an experience with them. Um, I think the other part of it is totally selfish, Sarah. I like to do it. It really feeds me. The desert feeds me. The people going out there and having experiences feeds me. It gives me time to hang out with my friend that will rarely come off of her ranch. And so uh, I think I'm selfish sometimes. Um, I want to do it. So why not take a gang along? You know, it's like when we were teenagers or when we were really young and we're getting ready to go to the club. You don't want to go by yourself. You know, you want to gaggle. Oh, your friends. <laughs> yeah, 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 you want to gaggle to go with you. So off you go. And, um, and so that's another reason. I also had made a promise uh, to someone long ago who said, what I really want you to do is bring people here. And I've tried to honor that. And so I do. 
we're gonna we're gonna do it again this year. We're gonna do it later in the year. Mexico and Sarah, you're on know all about it. You're gonna be an integral part of it. And maybe you can get word out to people once we know some of the good details. Yeah, calling all the plant people, call all the friends, call all the plant people, all the wilderness people. Um it's going to be great. Something will we have happen. a wild place. We are 30, about 35 miles from anything. And even then, not much. So uh, bring, bring four wheel drive. <laughs> we're, we're out. We're out there. Yeah. Ideally. Yes. I will not be bringing my car this year. Yeah. My car got stuck last year. I don't want to risk it again this year. I don't know what's going to happen. I'll have a dog though. It'll be fabulous it'll be wild it'll yeah be you got your dog back um, here artemis he'll be a desert dog and we'll see the milky way it's the brightest some of the brightest i've seen the milky way other than the dark of alaska is out there in the desert and we'll learn how um, to make desert latrines mm -hmm. and how to build shelter and how to build shelter in our outdoor shower mm -hmm. And, and um, well, there is no sweat lodge. Oh, well, we'll do something. We'll sweat another way then. The sweat lodge has has um, come down. And um, so, and not to be rebuilt again right now, but we have that beautiful fire pit um, that Pam built, her sister built so lovingly and um, and a great desert. You know, and I, um, uh, it is so far to get to Washington from here. Um, so that uh, I think I have a group of students that may be going to um, Asheville this year again for the herb conference that's there. I'm not going to be taking a group east this year. Um, I have to take a granddaughter to Iceland. If you were to describe, like, from the Midwest, the journey to go to the desert, or maybe even not people from the Midwest, but, but you know, to sojourn, to pilgrimage, to travel to a different place with a different ecology and a different habitat, to then go back home and to take a lesson with you from a certain type of place, what, what is... Do you think the lesson of the desert to go to the Southwest in comparison to the Northwest, like the rainforest and the coastal trees that are up here? And because I, th I, when I lived in Independence, I thought so much about the three trails and being three trails and walking historic Independence and all of the history that's there, and thinking so often about what it would be like and what what trail I would, if I were, you know, going west with nothing, um, how to make that decision, what different, the different places could teach me, um, or what kind of relationship I could have with them. So what's, yeah, what's coming up for, for you, the lessons from places and why, yeah. and why that place? It ends up being the same thing to me. It ends up being water. And in one place, water is kind of hidden and you have to know where it is and you have to look for it. Mm. And, you know, so I love going to the desert. I've always loved going to the desert. I've gone to the desert since I was a, a child. My father would take me to the desert and I've taken vacations to Death Valley. And, you know, I enjoy going to the desert. But the other side of me, I, you know, I married an Oregonian boy over 50 years ago, and the Pacific Northwest has been a part of my life every single year I am there. So I understand what you're saying about these connections um, for this part of the country, the Kansas City Independence, this area, with both the Santa Fe Trail out to New Mexico and the Oregon Trail, of course, out into the Pacific Northwest and uh, specifically into Oregon, but uh, groups splintered off and went up into Washington and Montana and uh, 
Idaho. And, and then I think of, you know, our friend who's living in Idaho, who I never thought would leave this part of the country. So, so I, I think that the lessons we learn in the desert, it's about our core and our foundation and how we conserve water, how we hold on to this elixir of life. When we go to the Northwest, here's all this abundance of water. So it, it's learning about our fleshiness. It's, it's learning about what got built on top of the bones. And so for me, we have to go all of those places. Um, the other thing that really stands out to me that I learn a lot about in the Pacific Northwest, but I'll also say that my life in Hawaii was like this and in getting ready to uh, go to Iceland again, but that's volcanic activity. And that work of the earth creating new earth and the vibration of what that feels like. Um, my very favorite thing to do and what I have to do once a year is I have to, I have to get to the beach I don't care what the weather is. I have to lay down on the beach so that one part of me can feel the ocean coming in, the big water. And one part of me can feel that pulsating of the magma below. That really feeds me. It gives me that fire and ice Um within myself so that I can ready myself for things that are coming. I mean, if anybody thinks getting old is easy, you just have to hang around. And no, it's, it's work. And then the more you want your life to be as you age, the more work it seems to become. And so I had kind of through pandemic times and such kind of just sat back and thought, well, this is it. Oh no, this is not it. I still have to come to Oregon, lay on the beach, feel the magma. I still have to go to the desert and get stripped of my bones. I love going to uh, the far North. I like going, I know you went to Alaska, uh, one of the places that I'm wanting to get to. Um, I'm also considering a nice Nova Scotia trip. Um, that seems to be kind of calling to me now. I think what travel does, first of all, I think it makes us just better human beings uh, because we learn to tolerate different peoples and different situations and different foods and learn that, you know, not everybody is as hung up on stuff as we are. Um, I, I really enjoy that part of travel. I enjoy seeing landscapes um, that maybe geologically I've learned about. So I want to know what it really looks like. Uh, I think it's a way for us to put ourselves in our place, so to speak. Um, so that we're, we're not the mountain, we're the ant. Okay. And so, and we can be lots of things in our ant form. I'm not saying we're not mighty. You can be a mighty ant. However, you know, we're, we're not everything. There is this world that functions around us um, in a way that isn't always scientific and isn't always logical. And, you know, sometimes it's very heroic and sometimes is what we often refer to as wise woman tradition, but it it's just going to the simplest thing, not always making life so complicated. And um, so I think traveling humbles us in those ways, um, especially if you don't always go on the, you know, five-star everything included trip, but you try to do it yourself and get through it and rough it yourself. Look at car trips. You just had a big car trip. You know, car trips are like, um, they really teach you what you got inside. 
Yeah, you learn a lot when you drive from, you know, the gateway to the west all the way to the coast. You drive I drove through the Rockies, the Cascades, um the the prairies, the the flat of the of the Flint Hills, um and these rolling hills in Utah that covered in snow were just gorgeous and but I I thought even on that trip about I get I don't know what the this like the pioneer stories um have been in my mind lately but again thinking about like how hard moving across land would be without a car <laughs> um because oh, I don't have that in me. I I don't I don't have that in me. I don't have that wherewithal in me. I don't think. Um, but how what a luxury it is to be like, yeah, I want to be over there in three days and to experience so much of that. I mean, just like, I think it took me a week just in settling because to that's a lot of land to move across and for a human body to i mean even plane rides are just trippy in that way to, but humans moving i i'm thinking now of like the the anthropom like the 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 evolved body that we are the shock of that thing to experience that thing um i guess spiritually we can we can handle it because we can um go on stories and go on trips in our imagination without without necessarily moving but to physically move that distance um is a lot to experience so oh you're kind of frozen are you still there okay um oh there you are great where do you want to go from here what, oh, what, what... let's um let's talk about healing for a minute what heals what healing is um because i i've i just started a new group of students so you know they're all ready to cure cancer and um and and i i appreciate that i i appreciate that they are coming from a place where they're wanting to make a big impact and um and i truly do want people to have that kind of an impact. But I wanna talk about what it is to, to really heal and what that means on a variety of different levels. So one form of healing is to heal our physical body. All right, and we can do that in a variety of different ways. I will also tell you that some of the most healthy people died on their healthiest day. So the end goal is of healing is not, not to die. The end goal of healing is to be comfortable where we're at. And comfort sometimes is discomforting, if that will make sense. Sometimes it's, for us to be, we may not be comfortable, or our body may not be comfortable, but we have come to understand it or to, you know, my, my favorite old word, grok it, we've come to embody it in such a way that it no longer feels stressful or distressed or diseased. So, so healing isn't necessarily the lack of disease. Healing to me is comfort. You know, and then sometimes I think about astrological signs and I go, oh, well, you're just a cancer sun sign. So you just want to be comfortable. So that's where all of that comes from. And maybe that's, you know, the lesson to be learned is, oh, yeah, here's a group of people who really focus on comfort. Here's a group of people who really focus on discomfort. You know, maybe there is that type of uh, uniqueness to all of us. So again, my point is I want healing to be where someone is comfortable, where there is happiness, and um, where 
where we have nourishment for both our minds and our bodies, but especially for our spirits, because I do believe we are um, a bit of a spiritual being on a journey. I'm not sure I go into all the new age things or any real organization, but I do believe that we're here to be on some kind of a journey. And if that journey can help one another, then that's healing. That's healing for all of us. So again, health is is this thing that we seek. It's kind of like homeostasis in our body. We seek, we seek it, but we're not sure we ever really want to get completely there. It, healing, you know, we seek it. We, we want to have healing, our food to be healing, our words to be he healing, you know, our drinks to be healing. We want to be healed um, in, in ways that are beneficial to both the person being healed and the healer, because the healer also is wounded and needs to be healed. So in, in coming in community with one another, we work together towards healing. I think I talked in a circle. You did, but I, I, it makes me wonder if like, so there are types of people who, who are more prone to focusing on comfort and then other types of people who are more prone to focusing on discomfort because, and it's funny, I was thinking of astrology right before you brought it up, because this is something that Regina told me in an astrology workshop or class or series or something that, um, like something about Pluto in my first house, how like, it's not normal that I feel more comfortable knowing that there is chaos and discomfort and some teachers should be more afraid of something, but then other people would say that that's because I've become more balanced to being able to withstand the unknown, which is most of life around me. Um, but what you're saying is that some people just focus more on finding what's comfortable and some people focus more on finding what's uncomfortable and in a community that could actually balance itself out. I think it does balance itself out. And I think that both of them are important. You know, it's the eternal optimist and then the antagonizer. And we, we need to have that because, um, if if everything was just all goodness all the time, would we prepare for winter? You know, that would be the question. Would we prepare for winter? Because we need to have those folks that are kind of antagonistic and anxious saying, oh, we need to get ready for winter to keep everyone motivated. So I don't, I don't know that there's just one right type way of being. I, I right. think that the more we can embrace the differences amongst us, the more we are able to be comfortable with differences. You know, you've seen me in some, and then sometimes I fall apart and I don't hang so well. And, um, and I think that's probably true for most of us. And so on those times when I'm facing adversity and doing it well, I feel very healed and find that act to be healing. And then on those times when adversity is really overcoming me, I have, I have learned to go and be by myself for a little while to kind of pull in and, um, and I don't mean don't take it personally, because sometimes when these things are coming at us, it's personal. And so I have to go in and say, okay, what's my bones? I have to go back to the desert and get down to those bones. And what are the bones of me? And are those bones strong? And are they strong enough to hold flesh? And, and if they're not strong enough to hold flesh, then I need to rebuild some bones. And those, those individuals that confronted me in those ways to take me to that place did me such a service 
it gave me an opportunity to rebuild my bones. And we need opportunities to do that. And we're never too young or never too old to build new bones. Oh, I love that. Um, it's just reminding me that sometimes I'm so hard on myself for not being a certain way or not acting a certain way or saying certain things. Or I'm always thinking I should be doing something different or better or more. And um, realizing that actually, no, you're right. There is no one way of being. And even though we can think that all we want to actually live it out is much more challenging because it means accepting who we are and accepting that what I am and who I am is just enough to offer my community and my, and the people around me also lean on me for those things. And I can show up as just enough. And that is precisely the home like that's that's the 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 home for humanity podcast that's what it's all about um is is finding a place where you can lean on the people around you because I think that is a luxury very very often for most people these days it is a luxury to have uh, yeah people around you that that do fill in those gaps because I feel like so many people are stretched so thin and so resourceless and even the resources that we had you know are gone now or changed or different or it, there's new boundaries and people are in new chapters so um how do we you know when when the old ways don't work like when the healing when what has healed us in the past doesn't heal the same way it used to Where do well you find first of all first this is home yeah yeah okay this is Welcome home it's the only way you get all right this is home and so we're going to love our home and embody it within us think of all the skills that you've acquired over the past 10 years of you as the ones that I the skills I've learned over the past year 10 years now live inside of me so first this is home and then that embodies that skill set that allows you to go out and actually create community with one another we talk about that word comes out of so many mouths community 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 and yet we are only just starting to really understand what that means and the first part of it is what i think we've talked about an acceptance of one another that we're different we're you know we're different and we can be different and we can express ourselves differently, but we can still care about one another. It doesn't have to be adversarial in our compassion. We can still have compassion. And, you know, you know, the story of me forever uh, praying to Kuan Yin for like 25 years. And then I got to take care of my mother in hospice. And I went, oh, I have Kuan Yin. I have Kuan Yin right here. Now, I may not be living a Kuan Yin life, but that tool is within me. That type of compassion is within me. So we build our toolkit and we go out into the world and we will find like-minded people, but more often we will find non-like-minded people. And I like to talk, obviously. I can talk on and on and on and on. But I've really made it a, a huge thing in the past few years to really listen, deeply listen. Uh, most, most of us come from such a hurt and wounded place. And to be able to really tune our ears in to being able to listen. I, I hope you may humanity has a lot of years left and and thousands and thousands and thousands of them and that's not for for me to know right now but uh 
we we do have to get close with the earth, close with the plants and close with each other to be able to do that. Yeah, definitely. That feels that feels like a good place to end today. I think that's the that's that's the sacred period. You just said it. I want to have more conversations about many more things in the future. Would you like to be would you like to be interviewed again or have another yes. conversation? Uh, okay. I will be happy to. I love you, Sarah. You know I love you. And I'm right there with you and I'm going to support you and I'm going to help you get flesh on those bones. Great, great. I want to help other people get flesh on their bones too and to help build bone and help give people a space and the opportunity to a realize that you have bones that you can build <laughs> and that we can build them together and i one of my most favorite things that i'm also learning is what you just said at the end too is is that healing and helping others do that helping others with their needs is what is healing too and being able to show up um with a, another is showing up for myself and um that's what the heal that's what healing is to me so thank you Kayla I love you too and I look forward thank to you